My dad was one guy who enlisted and went to war, became a pilot, and did his job, and that was symbolic of so many other Americans. This beautiful cemetery with the wall of the missing, the beautiful chapel, is a place of reflection. They have subsequent generations of people who are looking at their family history and thinking, well, my great-grandfather is buried here and people still remember him. ABMC is taking care of our ancestor. When people come to our sites, they're learning why this place is important, why these individual stories are important, why we continue to operate the way that we do. You lose that first life on the battlefield. That one person could lose their life a second time when we forget them. There's no greater calling and no more worthy assignment than to keep that memory alive. My name is Bruce Malone, and I am the superintendent of the Musagon American Cemetery. I do live right here on the site. You get to know the local people. They still tell the stories. You see little children being told this soldier died in our town. My grandfather is buried at Henri Chapelle Cemetery in Belgium. What I do now, it's a way to give back. The Argonne Battlefield is one of the most hallowed places. What remains to this day, and may it ever be so, the bloodiest battle in American history. Like a lot of World War I battles, this went on for weeks and weeks. It ended with literally the armistice on November 11th, 1918. Imagine you're one of those young soldiers, and as you're moving forward, guy to the right falls, this guy over here falls, you hear a scream behind you, or your lieutenant goes down. You look back to this hillside, and the Army Graves Registration is now burying the buddies that just fell as you came across the hill. You have to be thinking, how long before I end up on that hill? How long before I'm over here? Things that happened on this hill were just horrific. But today, under our care, you can hear the birds chirping, the flag waving in the wind, and it's a tranquil, serene 
site. It's an honor to be here, but above that, it's a privilege. Very few people get to do what I do, and I'm proud of that. So I will do my best at it, absolutely. I, I don't want to let these guys down. ça demande. Il faut déjà que ça passionne les personnes, qu'ils aiment faire leur boulot. Toujours avoir une qualité de travail irréprochable. On ne peut pas reculer d'un mois, mettons, le travail qui est au jour le jour à travailler. Qu'est-ce qui arriverait si vous ne le faisiez pas, justement <rire> Très bonne question. Ben, je pense que... Je ne sais pas, aucune idée. Je n'ai jamais eu l'occasion de... On n'a jamais eu l'occasion de laisser euh, les tilleuls non taillés un an. On est obligé d'avancer. C'est pour faire avancer le travail, que le cimetière reste correct et propre. Headstones are marble. Marble, like a lot of other stones, will wear. They will crack. They will absorb things from the ground that will discolor them, and the engravings themselves will wear out. So from time to time, we have to replace headstones. A headstone could probably last 70 years out in the elements before it's no longer up to our standards. Je m'appelle Adrien Raymond. Je suis robot opérateur au, sur le site de Meusargonne. Mon travail consiste aux gravures des stèles. L'essence de notre travail, ça reste quand même les sépultures des soldats, que ce soit à Meusargonne ou sur les autres sites. Quand je suis arrivé, j'ai compris, notamment quand j'ai vu la gravure se faire, qu'il y avait un devoir de, de perfection, de travail bien fait.
suis quand même fier de mon travail, et pour la BMC et pour les états unis Je vais faire attention à, à faire un meilleur travail possible pour euh, rendre le cimetière euh, comme il doit être. Parfait. The headstones lie in perfect rows. The positioning of the burials has nothing to do with rank of the individual soldiers, race, creed. For the World War I era particularly, when the army was rigidly segregated, this was a very progressive idea. I think that reflects the philosophy. There's a kind of democracy of death. In death, they're all equal. Almost immediately after the First World War stopped in 1918, the Graves Registration Service, the GRS, got about the work of collecting bodies and by that point, they were scattered in literally thousands of different grave sites. A lot of the work was done by African-American soldiers and very grim, very grim labor. The decision was made that repatriating 75,000 bodies might be a little bit too much for the resources of the government then at hand. The War Department sent out ballots to give the individual families the choice. 45,000 of those 75,000 bodies went home. A little bit less than 30,000 of them were to stay in what turned out to be eight permanent cemeteries maintained by the American Battle Monuments Commission. This soldier is the reason we're here. It's that simple. Pick one. We have the trees, the fountain, you know, the grass and all, but uh, it's all about this soldier. There were six children all together. William, was the oldest, and my grandmother was the next oldest. She was pretty close to William. He was killed in 1918, fighting in the Meuse Argonne. Our great-grandparents were asked, do you want William remains to come home to Minnesota? My great-grandparents said, no, the remains can stay in France. And so the ABMC cemetery was a place of closure. We would get a lot of questions saying, you know, you gotta bring the remains home. You, you know, they're coming home. That was always the thing, you, you know, it was so important that the remains go home. When I said, no, they are home. I mean, you know, this is Omaha Beach. The fact that he was a D-Day casualty, that's not lost on us. I knew that these were people of my uncle's generation it just seemed like the right place.
Bon, il n'y a plus quoi. Donc, je m'appelle Olivier Gassion et je suis le responsable technique et opérationnel du cimetière de Normandie depuis 25 ans. Il a fallu trouver un endroit qui était dans des croix déjà, qui était en alignement. Il a fallu calculer pour les pentes, pour l'excavation. Nous sommes en train de préparer la plateforme qui doit être de niveau par rapport au terrain qui, lui, est en pente. De manière à pouvoir, avec l'élévateur, descendre le cercueil vraiment de façon parfaite et rigoureuse. I know that it's a superintendent's job to say, this is the best team I've ever had, but this is truly the best team I've ever had. They know that they're in America's most prestigious cemetery overseas. They know how important this is. Je pense que les gars qui sont enterrés ici, qui se sont sacrifiés, méritent le, le plus haut niveau. Rien ne sera jamais trop beau et trop parfait pour eux. Center, face. Forward, march. Left. 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 Right, left. Forward. It's not very often when there is a memorial service and a graveside interment, and it takes place when not a single person here has ever met the deceased. That is the case with this young man we honor today. As I look across the headstones, mostly belonging to young men in their early 20s, just like Bill, I think of all of the stories associated with these amazing persons. And I think of their families, their parents, their spouses, their siblings, and perhaps in some cases, the children they never saw grow up. Ready, aim. Fire! 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 Cease firing! Man, on behalf of our great nation, please accept this flag and faithful service. The sand that we use for this operation comes from Omaha Beach itself. The rosette is a laurel wreath, which symbolizes eternity. And then the eight points of the compass, which symbolizes that we will continue to look for them at all points on the globe until they're found. The rosette also signifies that William McGowan is no longer uh, missing in action. There's 1,557 names on the wall of the missing. We added the 20th rosette today. That rosette, for me, and I think for a lot of my siblings, that was the closure. I mean, that was the, you know, that was the moment. I feel like I've done something for my grandparents when the rosette went into the wall. We've got to get this right. We want the family to think that we care, because we do. Nothing reflects better what a nation values than what it will ask its young people to go. 
die for. And in same fashion, I think nothing speaks better of a nation than how well it will try to preserve the memory of those who have answered the call and made the, the ultimate sacrifice. They gave up their yesterdays so that our todays would be bathed in the kind of freedom and liberty that we so treasure. Any time that you get to talk to a veteran is a very moving experience. Of course, we're, there are fewer and fewer of those, but uh, you'll find that they're incredibly humble men. I was in Luxembourg in the month of November. It's eight o'clock in the morning, and there's a tall man out there, six foot four or more, and he's got yellow roses with him. Uh, we don't open till nine, but I went out there and asked him what he was here for, and he said he was here to place a yellow rose on the uh, headstones of 31 of his comrades. And so we brought him inside, let him warm up, and we said, so we're going to knock this out quick because we've got a golf cart and we've got a computer system. We'll find them. And he said, no, I, I don't want to do it that way. And so he started at, row, at plot A, row one, cross number one, and went through all over 5,000 headstones and didn't miss a single one of his friends, which told me that he was reading every single one of those crosses. Joe Schumacher was the staff sergeant. He was in the 17th Airborne Division. He said on the 6th of January during the Battle of the Bulge, They've already taken heavy casualties, and they've split his company up into three platoons and given each platoon a Belgian town to defend. When they got to the town, there was a small hamlet with three homes, a barn, and a chicken coop. He was told to take three men with him and go make sure there are no forward observers in those houses. Joe had received the newest addition to his platoon. He'd been in Europe two weeks and is thrown right in the battle of balls right away. He had no confidence in the man's ability to clear a house by himself. So he told the soldier to go clear the chicken coop, knowing there were no Germans in the chicken coop. When the soldier came back, he had found an egg. None of them had had anything to eat since the 3rd of January. So there was the discussion about cooking the egg and separating it into four pieces, but everyone thought that would be a waste. And so they took the egg, they put it in a small box that they found, and they made a pact amongst each other that if any of them survived the Battle of the Bulge or World War II, he should eat the egg. Joe said he's the only one that survived. And he hasn't eaten the egg since the 6th of January, 1944, 1945. Uh, still haunts him today. Oh God, I'm glad that I am young, free to go, wander, to venture, to explore. Let me live life while I am able. When I change from the spring of youth to the first frost of age, and then to the white winter of old age, let me be able to say, I have lived and I am not sorry. My dad wrote under a pseudonym he used his mother's birth name rather than hence when he was writing his poetry. Uh, apparently he thought that was more sophisticated. I mean, he was 19 or 20 when he wrote these. So even though he didn't live to the white snows of old age, I think he experienced life and enjoyed it tremendously. I'm proud of all these people. Oh, Angel, what a difference from the last time we were here, that cold, rainy, windy November day. Because I know Angel Matos, the superintendent and his staff. Here we are, Grace. Ah, there it is. Lauren Hitz. You know what I find interesting is I always remember his gravesite. Uh, headstone number 25. That's my birthday. That's what it reminds me of. And there's sadness, of course, but it's a peaceful thing, knowing that they are not forgotten, that ABMC is taking care of them and 
that the people of the United States are remembering their work, their duty, their professionalism, as well as their sacrifice. From the very beginning, these cemeteries were thoughtful. They are artistic. Every time a plant or a tree is replaced, it has to follow the exact plan. That's one of the beautiful things about these cemeteries. They don't sentimentalize. They are proud and strong. And you look at the architecture, it's, it was done with dignity and honor. And that's what's coming through. There's a lot of things that goes into making this happen. I have a staff of 14, what I call artists, because every day they come here and they, and they put their magical touches on everything that they do. Um, there is not a day that goes by that my staff doesn't impress me with what they're doing. For example, if you take a bench, if you take a chair, a lot of people do not look into what goes into preparing that bench for our site. They tend to just look at it as something normal. And for us, uh, I think it's not normal. Um, it's what we, that's what makes us unique. This is the centennial of ABMC. I'm not going to be here in 100 years. But I like to think of whoever the superintendent is, whoever the green team is, that this will still be a living, vibrant place where descendants down the line of my family and all these other families can come experience a place where equality reigns, a place where each soldier is respected and honored for the service he provided. And ABMC is doing that now, and I am certain that it will be doing this in another hundred years. My name is Charlotte Jusnard. I'm the museum curator here at ABMC. I'm in charge of all the collection of the agency. So this is an exact replica and a, a model of the Florence American Cemetery. This model, as you see, that was built maybe in the 50s is exactly what the cemetery looks like right now. So it's really interesting to have the in front of you this small version of it and knowing that today, right now, it's still how it looks and it's exactly how it was built. I think it's a very important uh, testimony on the process and how we build cemeteries. It's very important to remember that everything has a meaning where we put the tree, where we put the building. Nothing is just there by accident. Everything was built in a way to commemorate the soldier. We 
We're looking at the plaster molds. They're both in the Florence Chapel uh, facing each other. We can see the grid and some crosses that were made with a pen. This is the sign that this was used as a prototype. It's not a classical representation of an eagle. Normally the eagle is facing with the head looking on the side. It's interesting to have a sculpture that gives different way of interpretation. It's not only the America, but it's also the fight, the war, the, the sacrifice. It's a different way of uh, looking at it. My biggest dream is that maybe in 100 years we will have an ABMC museum somewhere with all of our pieces displayed. If you get someone or something that explains, well, they choose this color for this reason and they choose this type of trees or this type of stars for the other reason, it stick with you more. Like you get the information and you remember it a little bit more. I would love to see that exhibited somewhere with like a, a labels behind it that says ABMC collection. And I hope yeah, that that happens and it will be, I think, a really great, great thing to see. <laughs> Well, the ABMC was established by act of Congress in March of 1923. There were at least two fundamental purposes. One was to create sites of remembrance, cemeteries, but ultimately monuments as well. On Hill 204, overlooking Shadow Pierre and the Marn River, stands this beautiful monument to commemorate the valor and sacrifices of the American soldiers who fought in the region. It is for me a distinct pleasure to see before me, on this former battlefield, so many veterans who served here and elsewhere with the American Army in the World War. General John J. Pershing was a living American hero. He was the equivalent of a six-star general. There had never been anybody holding rank that high in the American Army. I extend a warm welcome here today and trust that your visit to France may meet with your highest expectations. I greet you most cordially. He was very much a hands-on leader of the American Battle Monuments Commission. He wanted to be assured year in, year out that all that was, was being preserved. I'm leaving this morning for France to participate in the dedication of the first war memorial for those that gave their lives in World War II. We are surrounded here by those who paid the price of our mistakes or misconceptions. They paid the full price, and this must never be forgotten. For Marshall to come along a generation later, a World War later, with all of his skill and with all of his heart for the soldiers that had been under his authority as chief of staff of the army in, in Second World War. That's just amazing to me.
General Marshall was very anxious to see a cemetery in the Philippines to cement the post-war relationship between the United States and the Philippines because it was on the 4th of July, 1946, that the United States granted the Philippines their independence. When you see all of the white crosses, it just seems so anonymous. There's little distinction between the names, little distinction between the crosses. Filipinos and Americans are laid side by side in the same way that they fought, side by side, shoulder to shoulder. But uh, that's the beauty of it. It's symbolic of the equality of the sacrifice of all of those that are buried and memorialized here. So we'll start in here, our other cemeteries, most of which are in Europe, specifically cover particular battles or campaigns, but the Manila American Cemetery covers a whole range of battles and campaigns within the Pacific Theater of Operations. We have 17,000 that are buried out in the plots and about 36,000 names up here in the walls of the missing. And if you do the, the math, that would be more than 50,000 individual stories of those that served and died during the Second World War in the Pacific Theater. But today we'll My father joined me on a tour, and it's the first time that he's heard me take people around on a tour. It really opened his eyes to just how wide or expansive the, the story it is that we're, we're trying to tell here at, at Manila. I've always been very impressed with the way the U.S. honors and treats its veterans. My father being a veteran himself, I've seen firsthand how they treated him. And my son is now continuing the, the legacy, the heritage. I think that's important. As we walk among the walls of the missing, you'll find that there are state seals featured on the floors. But when I see this state seal in particular, I know that I'm in my favorite part of the walls of the missing, because if you look up here, the second name from the top, you'll see the name Lim Vicente, Brigadier General, 41st Division, Philippine Army, entered service from the Philippines. And he happens to be my great-grandfather. My grandfather is one of the more recognized heroes of World War II. He was the first Filipino graduate from West Point. He survived the Bataan Death March. He was involved in organizing the guerrilla movement here in the Philippines until he got caught eventually executed. Even as a young boy, my great-grandfather left quite the legacy. My grandfather, Vicente Jr., and my dad, Vicente III, really made it a point to make sure that I realized that legacy and how important it was to keep it going, to preserve it, to honor it. You know the famous war heroes, you know the battleships, you know certain aspects of history. We get an opportunity to speak about individuals that maybe didn't get the notoriety that some of the other heroes or battles have that they teach, you know, as we're growing up going through school. There was one letter before the fall of Bataan that he wrote his wife. probably the last known letter from those battlefields. He basically said, I sincerely give the credit to my officers and enlisted men. They're the ones who did it all. And mine was only to inspire and to lead them. 
And when history is written, I will give them all the credit and their satisfaction is mine to share. Sometimes, some of those stories feel like they kind of call out to you. I think those are the stories that are really important to tell because no one else is going to tell it. It's more than 50,000 individual stories that are just waiting to be told. If not me, then who? <laughs> if not now, then when? I'm a veteran myself, and I served, and I take a lot of pride in, in my service that I did uh, for the United States Marine Corps. So I have that knowledge. I know their sacrifices, and knowing what they have went through just for us to be able to be sitting here and do this interview and get this opportunity is something that I try to make sure that our visitors, our employees are aware of that like the agency says, time will not dim the glory of their deeds. because someone came and left them, but they're getting old, and someone next week's gonna come lay some more. So we'll, we'll pick these up and make room for some new ones. How about that? Good idea? I'm a veteran. I did 20 years. Went home. I got a job that most people would have been happy to have, uh, but I didn't have a mission. There was nothing pushing me. That sense of purpose. That's where we're from. The kids are getting a little older, so they're kind of starting to understand a little more what this is about. Like many of us who are here and are veterans, we've lost people in Afghanistan and Iraq or maybe even Panama and Desert Storm. We don't need this explained to us how important this is, the, the commemoration and the, the remembering. So I think it probably didn't take me very long at all to realize that, that uh, this is where I'm, I need to be. It's a good fit for me. I particularly like the cemetery because it's small and it's an intimate cemetery. I always say it's a family cemetery. They're all a family. The people who look after the cemetery are a family. And the people around the cemetery, the community, is a family. And it will always be looked after. Hey, Jerry, how are you doing? Good morning. Good morning. I'm Johnny. Nice to meet My you. My pleasure. The How you doing? My uncle is Andrew Perry, who served in the 45th, 180th Infantry. He became a code talker. He was reconnaissance. And when they first landed, he would call back to another Choctaw on the other line, telling them where this is, this is, this is, and this is. They had to come up with their own codes, you know, what they would call a tank and what they would call a different equipment. Not one code was ever broken. None. Now, Andrew brought Mama to you this year. Have to take her back. It's nice to see someone else know about them because it was never talked about. His mother said goodbye and that was it. I mean, that's really sad. I mean, I could never, mm -mm. Imagine hearing your son being killed and is buried. You're not going to believe this when you see this. Mom, still, all this for Andrew? She said, look at this place. I have a daughter. Her name is Liz. 
and she's been absorbing a lot. You'll be the one that has to tell the story. Yeah. yeah. I guess what everyone wants is to be taken care of and remembered, and he will never be forgotten. Never. Never be forgotten. I do have people who often come and say, I understand and I am grateful for what goes on here. Mm -hmm. Then they tell me, but younger generations don't. Thank you. And we can't blame it on all the younger generations. It's not exactly their fault. They just find themselves in a position where they're very far removed from the Second World War. We're all far removed from the First World War. Uh, but I think these places can be used, and we do actually use this cemetery as an educational tool for younger generations. We have school groups come all the time. So ABMC's mission is not just to commemorate, but we also educate. What is important and special about working for the ABMC is the ability to be a part of a collective effort to continue to tell these incredible stories. The ability for people to identify with something creates that emotional connection. It forms a stronger memory and it creates relevance. The American Battle Monuments Commission has always been interested in education. General Pershing himself understood the connection between soldiers dying, but for an objective, for a purpose. The ongoing work of education and preservation will always be unfinished. Closure is so important to families. There are families today who are still awaiting the location where their loved ones are interred. And there are also families where the family members have been buried with a Christian cross when they should have been buried with a Jewish Star of David. Tomorrow, we will be changing the headstones of two American soldiers who were identified as being Jewish versus of the Christian faith. So that is just an indicator of how ABMC is working with other federal agencies and other organizations to do the right thing. Someone once said that our flag, our American flag, does not fly because the wind moves it. Our flag flies with the last breath of each soldier who died protecting it. And it is precisely this that brings us here today. These Latin crosses that will be roofed today are not symbols that we say good riddance to. Rather, we bid them a fond farewell. We lower our heads in gratitude and respect to these silent civil sentinels who have so majestically stood guard over these young men for all of these decades. For all kinds of understandable and legitimate reasons, a number of American Jewish soldiers who were killed during the Second World War uh, were buried under Latin crosses. working together with the ABMC, whom we have found to be extraordinarily helpful, supportive, and respectful. We have embarked on an effort to right this historical wrong. Second Lieutenant Kenneth Earl Robinson, on behalf of the citizens of the United States of America, 
We thank you for your service. And Kenneth, on behalf of the Jewish people, we welcome you home. May the merciful one protect his soul forever. And may he bind his soul in the bonds of eternal life. The everlasting is his heritage. And may he rest in peace and let us say, Amen. There are many people here with me my dear family who wanted to join with their old mother and grandmother in her joy. And most of all, my dad, Ed Robinson. I feel him here with me, telling me good job. Thank you so much. Closure. Closure to the families means a lot to our agency because it's important to us to know that we've done the right thing. And ABMC is a unique, small agency with a really special mission. And that's to keep the memories alive. What I would like for people to understand about the American Battle Monuments Commission, behind the scenes, uh, all our locally employed staff. The effort that they put in to ensure that they keep the cemeteries looking like it's one that the families and the veterans themselves would be proud of. And without those employees, it, it would not be possible. So we're very grateful for the employees all around the world that ABMC has as part of their agency. You know, General Pershing said, time will not dim the glory of their deeds. And it's a concept and really a charter to the whole effort of the American Battle Monuments Commission these last hundred years. We have to make sure that as we go farther away from the events, that their deeds are not diminished, that are not forgotten, that people understand what they did. And I think that as we look to the next hundred years, I think that same quote will drive what the American Battle Monuments Commission will do.